I know we're going to have a couple of people who, uh, for other commitments, will be here a little later. So, Richard, we're calling the meeting to order. So let's, uh, Senator Wolf, if you don't mind, start. We'll go this way this time to do the uh, roll call of who's here. Uh, Dan Wolf, I'm appointed as the Senate President. Uh, Paul Smith, appointed by the Utility Workers Union of America, representing the good men and women who work at Pilgrim Station. Richard Rothstein, Plymouth Board of Selectmen appointee. Jack Priest, I'm the director of the Radiation Control Program for the Department of Public Health. We'll wait for Mr. Lynch. He's very quick. Come on up, Brian. Just got to find you a chair. Brian, wherever you sit. You. Introduce yourself, Brian, and it's not mine. welcome. You got to grab the mics tonight because only a few of them are working. Brian Sullivan, Site VP, Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. Uh, Joe Lynch with Entergy. Sean Mullen from Plymouth. It's Rich Grassy, uh, Minority Leader, House. Robert Jones, Health and Human Services. Bob Hayden, Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. John Flores, Governor's Appointee. Joe Coughlin, Town of Plymouth, Nuclear Matters Committee. Pine Dubois, appointed by the Speaker of the House. Sam Phillips, Director of the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. And last but not least. Thankfully, we had time. <laughs> you did? Dave Johnston, Mass DP, representing Environmental Secretary. Thank you. Uh, Chair determines we have a quorum. First order of business will be to review the minutes. And I, I, I've got to question the vice chair here at some point. I return, as you know, I may have, you might have noticed, I wasn't here for the last meeting. And there's one name card missing, and it's mine. I think there's some sort of a message here. I don't know, but I'll make inquiries of the Eight vice words. chair. Yeah, something happened. Fine, I don't know. Miss one meeting, and you're all gone. Um, any comments, edits, corrections to the minutes? I saw a couple of typos, but nothing major. I'll send them to him. Yep, if you don't mind. I'll do the same. Okay. <laughs> Alan, are you hiding out there somewhere? Oh, Alan's not here. Alan's not here tonight. He's a lucky man. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. So, uh, shall we sell, send the little typo corrections to you, Alan or to you? Uh, you can send them to Alan. Okay. Too. Yeah, that sounds better anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, with those typos, um, is there a motion to accept the minutes? So motion. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Accepted as they are. Uh, David, right into the uh, frying pan for an update on the uh, IWG and the MOU. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also have an update on my discussion with um, EPA. Excellent. I'm not sure if you want that right now. Sure. Why don't we do it? Is it with Mr. Papadopoulos? Um, actually, yes, it was with Mr. Papadopoulos. Excellent. Okay. I'm, sh I'm sure you made better progress than I did. I'm not so sure. Okay. But I will uh, share with you what I did, uh, what I did get. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll start with a, uh, an update. From Can everybody the, hear, David? No. We've got mic problems today. Try. Great. Thank you. I, I'll, um, I'll start with an update from the interagency work group. I'm just going to read this from my briefing, and I'll answer any questions folks might have uh, after I run through all the uh, items I was asked to share. So the, uh, the group is uh, waiting for a decision from the NRC on the Commonwealth's petition to intervene and for a hearing on the license transfer application. You folks know that uh, We've taken that measure and we're still waiting for a response from the NRC on that. The Commonwealth has filed a motion with the NRC, a proceeding to supplement the petition, um, and that was filed on the 24th of April, with information about Holtec's planned acquisition of Indian Point Units 1, 2, and 3 from Entergy. Uh, Entergy and Holtec have opposed our filing. Uh, I think folks may know this, but. <coughs> All filings are available on the Attorney General's website, and uh, 
I don't know if probably a better way to provide that information than me just read yep. through it. So uh, maybe I can share that with you and we can somehow yep. we'll distribute make it. that available. So I, I know uh, we often talk about uh, the desire to have a higher level of transparency and uh, everyone's interest in knowing kind of what we are pursuing. But I've really been asked to kind of limit my overview to the four or five things we've talked about in the past from a high level. And then I have a little bit of a sort of a explanation of why it is that we have to uh, proceed the way that we're proceeding. And I also, um, Mr. Chairman, have an update on uh, your question about whether this committee can be taken into some sort of executive yep. session. So uh, firstly, uh, the high level overview, nothing new here, kind of the four areas we're, con we're continuing to pursue in our discussions with Entergy and Holtec, and, uh, and those discussions are ongoing in spite of our filings for the intervention and the hearing. Um, firstly, um, financial assurance beyond the uh, trust fund. And as compliance with state uh, RAD limits, we've talked about those in the past, um, that being uh, 10 and 4. And also that uh, there is compliance with the state environmental standards uh, for non-RAD, and that would be for cleanup and restoration. Uh, emergency preparedness, and, uh, and I've been informed that there's been some level of discussion between administration folks and some of the communities uh, surrounding Plymouth. I have not been part of that discussion. So um, I'm going to read uh, the message directly from the Attorney General's office relative to uh, their reservations in providing, um, you know, kind of a, a clearer picture on exactly how the process I is working. So um, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to disclose any other information beyond what I just provided about the case because in doing so could seriously disadvantage the Commonwealth in the proceeding by potentially resulting in the waiver of the attorney-client work product, um, deliberative process privileges, or, in my comments, we could have an inadvertent disclosure of confidential litigation or settlement strategy or communications. So um, it's really <coughs> a function of maintaining um, the attorney-client privilege and so that we don't uh, overspeak and somehow jeopardize our efforts to um, best represent the Commonwealth in our dealings with whole tech and energy. So regarding whether the endicap can be taken into some sort of executive session, um, I've been advised that uh, uh, it cannot be taken into an executive session, that the endicap is not akin to a state agency, and that um, uh, it would not be uh, appropriate for executive session because the endicap would not uh, be using the session to discuss endicap litigation position and um, uh, we also have this situation where we have um, folks from Entergy on the Endicap. So, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it doesn't fit the bill for uh, being equivalent to a state agency and, and its complement of individuals is not uh, fitting that it be an executive session, which, you know, would involve potential disclosure of the um, process uh, which is uh, underway with the Commonwealth Energy and Holtec. So that is uh, basically my summary <coughs> of the work of the interagency work group. Okay. And um, I think uh, we have, uh, you know, Jack is on the group and uh, Robert Jones is on the group, John is on the group. So we have a few other folks here that are on the group. And um, I can tell you uh, that. Um, we've all done work for the group in the last number of weeks. I can tell you that I personally have put in uh, many, many, many hours of work on the group in the past two or three weeks, as have a lot of folks in the AGO and other areas. So yeah. it is a group that is doing a lot of work. 
Uh, I have a couple of questions and then I'd open it up. Uh, at this point, David, is there a document being shared with Entergy slash Holtec slash CDI between the Attorney General of us? Is there a document now that lays out a draft agreement? Yeah, I was asked to really stick to the script and uh, simply affirm that we continue to have a dialogue with those companies and we're continuing to work to strike the uh, best arrangement with those folks, um, you know, in the best interest of the Commonwealth. Okay. And um, the uh, opinion that was rendered as far as whether or not the handicap is akin, first time I've heard that one, but akin to a state agency, was that rendered by the Attorney General or by someone in, in her office? It was uh, rendered by someone in the Attorney General's office. Okay. Any other questions, oh, David? Yeah. A uh, quick question I've got. Uh, thank you, David. Is uh, when will, how long will these restrictions be in place uh, until the license is transferred? Or Chris, when? could you move the mic down? Yeah. Sorry about that. We're, yeah, we're all going to have to move the mic tonight. Uh, how long will these restrictions stay in place, and will they be terminated at the end of the uh, license agreement? Well, the restrictions are really going to remain in place until there's some kind of resolution. That's so, what I mean. right. I so mean, what's that? well, the um, we don't have a date certain for when the NRC will render their determination on the license ter um, transfer. Uh, nor do we know for certain when they'll render their opinion on our position on intervening on the license um, uh, transfer or our request to have a hearing. So you know that continues to move forward as determined by the NRC. And then on a parallel track, as we've talked about before, we continue to communicate with the companies in an effort to try to, um, you know, find a common ground that protects the best interests of the Commonwealth. But until, um, you know, one or more of those things are resolved, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to share any more information. Thank you. Any other questions? Time. Yeah, Rich. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the upcoming 2019 handicap annual report, does the uh, AGO office, uh, could they come up with a list of concerns and questions that they'd like the handicap to try to address or answer to help them out either directly or indirectly with any negotiations going on or or anything else in terms of the um, lawsuits going on without divulge, as you discussed, you can't divulge what's happening, but uh, we may be able to offer some generic guidance or thoughts on various topics. Uh, so uh, do you think the AGO would be putting something together or want to put something together that we could try to address as a panel over the next month or two or three? And we may not have the time or information to do it, but at least we would know where they're coming from? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'll bring that back. Uh, you know, I, I can say that the group is pretty well represented by the various uh, representatives of state agency, and as I think Becky Ullman talked about when she was here, we also pull in folks who actually aren't on the group per se for additional support, and as we've also talked about here, we've uh, secured with a contracting group four points who is the same uh, contracting group that was used in the, uh, by the state of Vermont in their resolution with the Yankees. But I will bring that back. Thank you. Yes, Senator. Just because, Mr. Chairman, I can count with my hands and my feet that we're not going to get to 11 votes to take a position, for example, on any of the pending legislation that is in front of the legislature. I'm curious whether the in, uh, interagency working group is looking at that legislation and is prepared or is planning to testify uh, at any of the hearings relative to the legislation that's pending. Not to my knowledge. So neither. They're, the, you're, the, that legislation is not something that is in your purview, Dave? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not aware that uh, they're looking at that. It's, you know, it's not impossible that someone in the group or at some, uh, you know, level 
within environmental affairs or somewhere else is looking at it, so I just can't speak to that. But, um, but I know that uh, I have not had any involvement whatsoever as part of the interagency work, inter work group, and, and I really have got a lot of time into it uh, looking you. at any of that. Okay. Any other before I have a comment? Um, yeah, Paul. Through the chair, a clarification for Mr. Johnson. At um, Yankee Road, the decommissioning of the other Commonwealth's nuclear power plant, that was done under the uh, leadership of the in Department of Environmental uh, Protection, I believe. Um, and, and that was done to the satisfaction of of, of the town and the Commonwealth and the regulators. Um, do you see any value being added by the addition of the Attorney General? I know we're in deregulated times, so perhaps the Commonwealth thinks it needs that leverage, but there's only so much money in the decommissioning trust fund, and you know I would like to see it used on the employees, the town, and, our, and the restoration of the site. As, as opposed to law firms and other, other, other agencies? Well, I really don't think I'm the best person to answer that question, but you know, I can just say that uh, you know, I feel like the interagency work group, with the assistance and involvement of the Attorney General, who, you know, they're on the group, we work with them regularly. I think we really uh, believe the way we're advancing our efforts is in absolutely the best interest of the Commonwealth uh, and required given, you know, this set of circumstances and how they differ from the circumstances out at Roe. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, let me just uh, offer a couple of thoughts and then perhaps a brief discussion, maybe even a motion and a vote. Um, David and Rob and Bob, certainly Jack, all of you, uh, I don't think anyone on the panel has any doubts how diligent and how um, honestly you've represented the interests of the Commonwealth, the town of Plymouth, and the region. We know how much effort you put into it, and I want you to know we all appreciate it. That being said, I will respectfully disagree with the unnamed source of this opinion, uh, because unlike the opinion, uh, by any measure, measure, any measure, uh, starting with the Chapter 188 of the Acts of 2016, the panel is, in fact, a state agency. Uh, it's enacted in law. Uh, it was empowered by the legislature, which is a typical example of it. We have to live with all of the other things that a state organization, public organization, has to live with. And I would refer to Section 14, Subsection 8, H, Subsection 2 and 6 which says, in part, number two, the chair shall keep the panel informed of the status of matters within the jurisdiction of the panel. If the negotiations with Entergy Holtec CDI are not within the panel's purview, I don't know what is. That is exactly what we're here for. We provided advice on it. We actually were the ones that created the interagency work group. So under that, I think we have a burden I certainly feel it as the chair to make sure we do everything so that in the most appropriate way possible without compromising any of the Commonwealth's positions legally or from a business perspective it is in any negotiation, we need to know more than we're hearing. And it's not you. Uh, you're in that very difficult spot. I'd also then point out subsection H, subsection 6, we shall also hire ex experts, contract for services and any other reasonable and necessary expenses. <laughs> I think it's worth the discussion that I ask the uh, commissioner, in this case, mm -hmm. the secretary, to uh, appropriate the necessary funds for the handicap to hire legal counsel to pursue a true opinion of whether or not we are, in fact, in the meeting and executive sessions, a minor piece of it, whether, in fact, the organization is. because. We're getting the judge and the jury here all one person. Now, as the senator pointed out, um, I can certainly count as well. And if I look around the table of our colleagues here, uh, if a motion is made, I don't think it's going to pass because of the unique nature of the enacting legislation that requires not a simple majority 
of the panel voting in president, but 11 members. And I would suspect, I suspect that it won't pass, and I'm not sure that anybody wants to make a motion, but I, um, I think it's worth a discussion because I am uncomfortable and disappointed, although I understand the reasons. I understand the rationale, and this is not being critical of any member of the administration or the IWG, and certainly not the Attorney General's office, all of whom I think are doing the absolute best they can. But I think it's an important point to be clarified, and I'd like to just open that up for discussion. Senator. Not to complicate matters, Mr. Chairman, but it may be the case that you as chair, seeking out the answer to that question, can do that with the authority of the chair without a vote. It, it, is, it is more of an administrative task than it is, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it even requires a vote. If you as chair said, you know, I need to, I need to part of my responsibility as chair is to inform the, the uh, NDCAP as to, you know, where certain lines are drawn, I think you have the authority and, and I almost think you have the mandate <coughs> to do that. And I'm not sure you need a vote. It does say shall. The chair shall. Yeah. yeah I think you're empowered by the, by, by, uh, by the legislation to seek out the answer to that and report back to us. And, and, I, and I would actually ask that you do that. I, you know, it's not a motion. It's just a request from a lonely member uh, to the chair. That had a little something to do with the legislation. Well, yeah. It, it, it's, could I just mm -hmm. put some color to it a little bit? Um, it's, it's strange to me, and, I, and David, I really understand and I appreciate the fact that if we open the door up and there are certain conversations at the IWG that, that could be a heads up to potential litigation, that that's the last thing, that mm -hmm. we, we do not want to undo what our purpose is mm -hmm. by undermining the process. But the other side of that equation is um, we're a little bit operating in the dark. If, if we, and I, don't, I wouldn't say we created the IWG, I would say that the, at the request of this committee, the executive branch, the governor, created the IWG. But still, I, I'm not sure we should be at as arm's length. And so I'm struggling with how do we get more information that will help us do a better job without compromising or jeopardizing uh, some of the work that the Attorney General or the IWG is doing. And I, I don't, I think that's an interesting discussion. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Okay. Any other comments? Richard. Notwithstanding Senator Wolf's point about your having the authority, I still would like to see a motion made and a vote for the record. I think it's important for posterity um, and depending on how things will transpire in the coming months, to have a track, uh, to have a um, uh, paper trail, if you want to call it that, on uh, how voting went and who voted <coughs> one way or another way. I don't want people coming back a couple months from now saying, you had an opportunity, you didn't try hard enough to have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody around this table is a professional or you wouldn't be sitting on this panel. And if I have to swear on the King James Bible, I'm not even of that faith, I'm of a different faith, I'll do that if I'm at an IWG meeting. Um, I'm sure everybody could uh, take an oath or whatever they would make us do uh, under penalty <laughs> of uh, being kicked out of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and worse. Any other comments? Yes, Pine. I, I, in, a, in a struggle to be productive, I guess, uh, is where I'm coming from. I, I, I agree with the Senator that I would ask that you make that inquiry um, relative to our role and even make an argument uh, because I share your opinion. But, but um, to the IWG, I think that, you know, and I'm sort of struggling with not burdening them uh, at the same time as feeling like there needs to be a way, and I, and I appreciate that, that the, the four of you at the table do take back our concerns, but, but a lot of people have concerns. Is there a way that we can set up a mechanism for delivering questions or information to the IWG that doesn't wait for a monthly meeting? Is there, is there some sort of process that we can, um, that we can adopt, if you will, that would, uh, that would recognize questions, filter them if they need to be filtered, and then pass them on, whether the IWG takes them up or not, 
given their time, that's another thing. But I think it's wrong to assume, because we don't even know everybody that's part of that picture, that all of our, our worst nightmares are, you know, being considered. Any other comments? Uh, my only comment is, um, you know, I tried to take some notes when you're running through uh, some of your references on the uh, chapter and statute, and uh, I'm certainly willing to take back any of that, that in particular, or any other uh, questions. You know, I brought it back. I don't know that I was necessarily asked to bring it back, but I brought it to the interagency work group and the AGO in hopes of getting some, uh, uh, getting an answer that would give some <coughs> comfort. And I don't think I succeeded in that regard. But, um, it, you know, the determination or the uh, opinion did come from an AGO, uh, not from the AG herself. But I'm certainly willing to bring that back and get something uh, more formal, more written. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be a secret what AGO offered the opinion, so I'm willing to do that. Okay. I'm going to um, do a little executive action here. It's particularly timely because our ninth or gender item is to uh, elect chair and vice chair so that if, if people tonight are not happy with what I'm going to tell you, uh, we can certainly make a change. Um, I'm going to take a hybrid of the advice and the suggestions, and I will put it in writing. I'll put it detailed in writing. And to try to get you a little bit out of the middle of this, uh, I'll CC you on it, but I'm going to focus it directly to the, to the commissioner uh, on both topics. And, Pine, to your point, um, I know myself, having read, read them all this week, um, Mary and Jim, of course, you circulate your thoughts to everyone. Uh, Henrietta sent out a great piece on the p petition. Uh, Janet sent out a reiteration of what we would already received. Uh, those are widely distributed, and virtually everyone on uh, this panel who's also on the IWG, I'm sure, has looked at them and read them and has considered them. Uh, I don't know how we could do a more formal process than that other than our annual report, which we'll also talk about tonight. So I'm going to try to craft a letter, and rather than getting into a committee, I'll try to craft a letter that captures the essence of what our concerns are and requests a little bit more clarity on them. And that's what I'll do, and I'll circulate it. Yep, Joe. <coughs> um, I share the concerns raised by my colleagues um, and feel as if a lot of the members of the panel are probably frustrated, uh, although understand and appreciate the concerns of the Commonwealth. Um, the last thing I think we'd want to do is to compromise the position um, of the Commonwealth, uh, particularly in regards to the motion to intervene uh, and the supplement and so forth. We don't want to do that at all. But on the other workings, if you will, of the um, IWG, even though there are four excellent representatives on the panel uh, with that working group, I still think there's a, a feeling of the other members of the panel that were sort of left out. Um, the, uh, we don't know who they are. We can never get involved. Uh, we're an entity <coughs> that we want to try and be helpful, and I think we've tried to do that uh, over these past two years, but nonetheless, it's at uh, arm's length. Um, and so to the extent that the Senator's comments and uh, the Chair's comments of is there some other way or some additional way um, where we can try and work closer together uh, as partners, again, without compromising the position of the Commonwealth with the sensitive issues that are uh, underway. Um, uh, I'm just one more of um, my colleagues who are sort of frustrated uh, with where we are but appreciate the position of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, we're about a few minutes late, and you know how I am about that stuff, so let us move on to the next agenda item. Joseph? Um, Mr. Chairman, do yes. you want a brief overview of my discussions with EPA? Oh, please. Yes, I'll, I forgot. I'll, in that we're late, I'll try yeah. to be quick. And I don't have a heck of a lot to report, like you probably found yeah. as well. So uh, in brief, I had a discussion with uh, George Papadopoulos from the um, Environmental Protection Agency and was advised that they are actively right now working on the response to comments. And uh, they provided me with their contact as being Intergy's Joe Egan. 
Joe, excuse me. Who? Uh, Joe Egan. And uh, you know they uh, they are working on the response to comments and the permit action with a uh, working together with their biologists and attorneys, and that they intend that the permit would be issued for post shutdown operations only. I know the 2016 draft was issued for operations and post shutdown, and uh, they were looking at uh, only issuing based on post shutdown which they believe will make the response to comments that much easier. And um, anyone, uh, once the permit is issued, anyone who commented on the draft can appeal the permit. Um, it'll be a th uh, within 30 days. And, um, and they would also need to appeal any mass uh, DEP action that might be done as part of a co-perming agency. And uh, I was advised by Mr. Papadopoulos that uh, if folks had questions beyond what I've provided here, that they can feel free to contact him. Did he say when the, they anticipate the permit? They um, were reluctant to give me a date other than to say that they are actively working on it. And, uh, you know, their fear is that some folks would get pulled off and that they wouldn't meet the deadline that, uh, that they would have me provide today. It did. You know what? I don't have his title, but I have his contact phone number. I might have, I might have no one. I'll look, I'll look for Jack Willing. Good job. Thank you, David. Any other questions on that? Joseph, sorry to be running a little late for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> my apologies. My bad. No, it's my bad. And the uh, one last update, which I think is maybe uh, among the more important updates, is that. Um, Mr. Papadopoulos uh, advised me that uh, Entergy, and this is all public information, that Entergy has made a request to EPA seeking to have a two-year delay in issuing the permit so that they can gather additional information on what their post-shutdown operations would look like, um, you know, specifically in terms of protections against biofouling and whatnot, uh, in so much as when they move to post-shutdown, the total flow uh, through the facility is going to be reduced by, I think, on the order of 90 percent or more. So um, that uh, information is public record, and, uh, and that uh, document uh, is available, as is EPA's response to that letter. I think that's a fairly recent development. And I think one of the important pieces here uh, is that we're now talking about a permit that will cover the decommissioning rather than the operational. It's a Joseph. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just in the way of introductions, uh, you all know me, uh, but we have a new member of the NDCAP panel, uh, Brian Sullivan, our site vice president, did introduce himself, and I'm just going to ask him to say a few words about his background um, and um, elaborate a little bit about himself. Okay, thank you, Joe. Again, my name is Brian Sullivan. I'm the site vice president at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. I'm a graduate of Massachusetts Maritime Academy. I began work in the nuclear industry in 1983, first as a startup and test engineer, and then in 1988 I went to work at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. Uh, worked for the next 21 years at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in various roles in engineering and operations, uh, various roles of increased responsibility. In 2010, I went to the James A. Fitzpatrick Nuclear Power Station, first as the plant manager and then uh, was promoted to site vice president. In 2017, I came back to Pilgrim as Site Vice President and uh, led the plant through recovery from Column 4 and through a safe shutdown. Thanks, Brian. Um, also, I'd like to take just a minute to uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. John Orenberger, who was a member of this panel for two years. Um, Brian is uh, replacing John on the panel, uh, but as you all know, John was a very active member of the panel for two years, and uh, he'll be retiring tomorrow, our employee separation date, so we wish him well. And I'd like to introduce to the panel uh, John Moylan. John is our new decommissioning director. You can stand up, John. So that kind of uh, gives you an idea. We've replaced John in that very important role, and uh, wish him well, and um, wish all of our employees well, and I'll go over that uh, momentarily. Next slide. Next slide. Um, 
So as many of you know, um, we shut the plant down uh, for the last time on May 31st. Um, at uh, 5.28 p.m. on Friday the 31st, we actually took the generator offline. And at 7.34 that evening, we, we did take the uh, reactor uh, offline for the, for the final time. That ended a 47-year record of safe, secure, and carbon-free power generation, uh, benefiting the region in many ways, most notably reliable power. On June 9th of this year, the reactor vessel was defueled safely, error-free, and had a schedule. And one day later, June 10th, Entergy certified to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that we had ceased power operations at Pilgrim and that the uh, vessel was permanently defueled. This is a significant milestone. Um, in doing so, we also acknowledge to the NRC that our Part 50 license under 10 CFR uh, was no longer authorized us to operate the plant going into the future. Now I'd like to uh, turn to what I think really is the most important topic tonight, and that is our people. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, tomorrow is our separation day, and some of you might have seen this publication in the newspapers, but if you'll allow me to read it to you, um, this was written by uh, Christopher Bach and our chief nuclear officer. Uh, acknowledging, actually, prior to the shutdown, for 47 years, Pilgrim has provided carbon-free electricity safely and securely for Massachusetts and the region. But its legacy is much greater than that. Pilgrim Station's people and their dedication to professionalism, <coughs> safety, and service are to be remembered and celebrated as we look back over the plant's history. These are the people who originally conceived the idea to site a reliably generating source of electricity in this area so that we could have affordable and local supply of electric power. They, des they designed the plant, selected the site, and achieved all necessary approvals. They prepared the site, built the plant, and tested all of its components. They added fuel to the plant for the first time in 1972, started the fission process, and used that heat to produce electricity. They harnessed that energy safely for 47 years, helping power the lives of thousands through hot summer days and cold winter nights. The people of Pilgrim raised their children and lived their lives in this area, serving the community professionally and personally, volunteering and making financial contributions to local charities and not-for-profit organizations. When I look back on Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station and its history of operation, I will remember the dedicated men and women who I met along with those who came before them with deep appreciation and respect for having served with honor and distinction. Thank you to all of the men and women of Pilgrim Station. And I appreciate your uh, understanding and what's going to be a very difficult day tomorrow. So tomorrow we will be separating 262 employees uh, from Entergy. I had given you updates in the past about um, our ability to place them within Entergy at other jobs at their choice. Originally, we had 115 employees entered into that process, and we're happy to say that 60 employees have accepted new positions within Entergy. And what that now leaves for us after tomorrow is what is known as our Phase One organization, and that is staffed with uh, 270 uh, positions going forward. Um, we will continue to work with our employees um, through the Department of Career Services here in the Commonwealth. Um, Different sets of training and um, classes are available for resume writing, interviewing skills, unemployment information, relocation services. All of these have been ongoing and will continue even beyond tomorrow. Um, other initiatives, I'm, I'm happy to say, have been going really, really well. And I uh, laud the Commonwealth for their support and um, continued uh, attention to our employees. But yesterday, we got some very good news from the U.S. Department of Labor. We applied for what is known as the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act. It's a petition before the Department of Labor that will provide um, additional um, services to our employees, including training, um, retraining, uh, relocation services, um, even uh, the ability to extend things like unemployment benefits. Uh, so that was uh, approved yesterday. Uh, that now transfers to the Commonwealth through the Department of Career Services, and they will actually implement that. And they've already set up information sessions next week for our employees. Even though they're separating tomorrow, we'll have all their contact information. We'll continue to provide information to them. 
So in addition to the Mass Department of Labor, we also have been working with Mass Hire at, here on the South Shore through their Career Center in Quincy, and they've already <coughs> um, offered some career seminars at the uh, Cordage Park. So um, very pleased to say that uh, we've been getting a lot of great attention for our employees going forward. Many are retiring and ending their career, which is uh, great to hear, but others would like to continue in a new career, and we're doing everything we can to help along with that. On the way of a regulatory update, um, we've been through this uh, back in November of 2018. We did provide our joint license transfer applications and all the supporting documents, PSDAR, site-specific decommissioning cost estimate, environmental impact statements, and the spent fuel management plan, and our co-mingled fund exemption. Holtec submitted the same with a different um, set of outcomes with a decon scenario versus our safe store scenario. Um, NRC accepted the uh, PSDR back in December, uh, license transfer application a couple days later, and then finally the commingled funds exemption. And uh, at this point, we stay in communications with the NRC, but essentially we've provided all the follow-up information, and they continue to uh, review these submittals. And at this point, we don't have any certainty as to when they'll render a decision. As I mentioned earlier, on June 10th, Entergy did certify to the NRC that power operations have ceased at Pilgrim and that fuel was permanently moved from the reactor vessel. One day later, we received a letter from the NRC informing us that they will no longer be assessing or evaluating us under what they call the reactor oversight process, so we'll switch to a different um, inspection and oversight process, and that's called the decommissioning inspection program, very typical for a plant that has certified that they are no longer operating. Uh, yesterday, June 18th, uh, we implemented the change, the first change to our emergency plan that's known as the post-shutdown emergency plan. This was previously approved by the NRC earlier this year. This will cover the period from yesterday through uh, March 30th of 2020. Um, it will essentially look like the same emergency plan, slightly less number of people, but we'll have four dedicated teams 24-7 coverage during their week uh, of coverage. We'll have new emergency action levels. They're primarily associated with the storage of fuel, either in the spent fuel pool or in dry cast storage. However, on-site and off-site programs will be maintained. Um, all of our previous EP requirements will be met, and we will continue to do things like exercises to demonstrate that we're proficient in the emergency plan. Um, as mentioned by Dave on uh, uh, Dave Johnston, on May 20th, we did submit a letter to the U.S. EPA and MassDEP uh, regarding our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NIPTES, permit uh, for post-shutdown activities. Um, in reviewing all of the needs of the plant and understanding that uh, a shutdown plant is very different, obviously, than an operating plant, um, we are suggesting what is known as a test period to address and assess service water needs post shutdown uh, consistent with the in place NIPTES permit that we're operating to today. Um, it is a two year period um, and that letter as Dave mentioned is publicly available and it provides additional background and provisions um, of why we're seeking this uh, going forward. And then finally in regards to a, a regulatory update on May 31st the timing was not coincidental with the shutdown in any way, just the way it worked out. Uh, we had been in negotiations with Eversource for quite some time on the sale of the switchyard. It is not common for uh, a generation company to also own the transmission uh, aspects of it. Uh, so for quite some time, we were um, interested in, in selling the switchyard, and as it turns out, with us uh, shutting down, Eversource was in, uh, also interested in owning our switchyard, uh, so we did consummate a, a final deal on the 31st. They will now own all of the equipment. We will still own the land, and they have easements to provide access to their equipment, and they will be uh, both maintaining and upgrading the equipment uh, going into the future, according to our, our contacts at Eversource. In regards to our uh, dry fuel storage update, um, as I had mentioned many times in the past, we have one operational ISFA pad with a capacity of 38 casks. Um, when we're all done with moving fuel, uh, we will need uh, 61 casks in total. 
Uh, right now we do have 17 loaded Holtec System 100 multipurpose canisters. Uh, each of those have 68 fuel assemblies, so we have a total of 1,156 uh, stored on the pad. That is the uh, scope of what we're going to be doing until we construct our second pad. Um, as mentioned earlier, we completed the defueling a week ago. So now all of our remaining fuel is in the spent fuel pool, uh, 2,958 assemblies. That will give us a total of 4114 um, uh, once we have everything uh, stored in dry casts. Uh, the ISFAC design of the new pad is sized to accommodate all of the spent nuclear fuel at the site. It will have a capacity of 70 casts in an array of 7 by 10. Um, I had provided some details in the past. The pad is about 75 feet above mean sea level. It's about 700 feet from the shoreline. And we had discussions about how close, how far away it was from Rocky Hill Road. Uh, it's over 350 feet, and the reason I mention that is right now they're actually doing the final surveying to site the pad. Um, the number I was given this morning is going to be more like 362 feet, but I thought I'd give you at least a uh, conservative number. And I had provided this graphic about our schedule. We <coughs> have completed all of our internal uh, requirements to go forward with the design. We have initiated the permitting process. Um, all of the important permits are complete, including zoning and construction. And last week, we received the uh, EPA's um, um, stormwater pollution prevention plan, which allows us to set up erosion controls, and they'll be doing that shortly. So we don't consider construction of the pad to be uh, started until we're actually removing asphalt and digging soil. Um, so that's uh, not too far off into the future. Uh, but we, um, we are on schedule to have the pad done by the end of this year, and then our fuel transfer campaign will start next year, and um, expectations is that will be done by 2021. And then finally, I wanted to give you an update on the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust Fund. Um, the uh, most recent uh, public information on the trust fund, we do it quarterly, uh, was at the end of March of 2019. The balance was $1.04 billion compared to $1.028 billion um, at the end of 2018. Those changes, um, and I don't have the exact granularity, but the changes in the balances are due to market fluctuations and payment of administrative trust-related expenses. I think I did mention the last time I provided you an update is that the trust fund is very conservatively invested. Uh, it has little or no influence from the market these days, and that's something we do as we get ready to potentially use the trust fund. One, did one uh, submittal that I do want to make people aware of is, um, but on June 5th, uh, we provided written notification to the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission pursuant to their records uh, and requirements, 10 CFR 5082, uh, Alpha 8, uh, Indigo Indigo, to withdraw the nuclear, from the nuclear decommission trust funds are uh, expenses incurred during decommissioning planning. And in that letter, we didn't have the precise number. We're still working those numbers right now, but it would be amount not to exceed $18 million. And there is a limit to how much you can withdraw for planning costs, and that's 3% uh, of the NRC's minimum calculation for what it would cost to decommission using their formulas. And that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 600, <coughs> excuse me, $650 million. So we have a limit uh, much less than the 3% of the billion that we have in the overall uh, trust fund. Um, but this will be the first withdrawal that we've made uh, from the trust fund since we made the decision to shut the plant down and started our decommissioning planning organization. I'll be happy to take any questions. Joseph. <coughs> Joe, thanks. Um, and I know you've covered it in the past, but I think because the uh, reactor is now shut down, um, it would be helpful just to uh, mention again, uh, since the fuel you mentioned has been uh, transferred to wet storage, <coughs> what's the planned time frame uh, for the last of the fuel assemblies to be moved to dry cask in the if So, um in the past, there was a, I, th I believe what you're asking is there was a cooling period that the newest fuel has to remain in the spent fuel pool. Um, the, the technology of today's casks um, 
has that much shortened from when it was in the past. For example, when we started the campaign at Vermont Yankee, it was looking like a five-year project. We moved that to a three-and-a-half-year project. Um, but the loading of these casts um, is, a, is a calculation that is done on a cast basis, and we believe that um, with the design of the cast, we can have the, uh, the newest fuel moved and completed by the end of 2021. So the, there's no real exact time frame where it has to cool, but we can actually start loading next year and um, go through the next two years roughly to, to finish all that work, and that will satisfy the, the cooling requirements for the newest fuel. Thank you. Senator. Yeah, I'm, uh, this isn't a stupid question. I'll, I'm going to pull up the mic. Sorry. Um, at what point does the fact that the NRC hasn't ruled on the license transfer actually have an impact on the work being done? I mean, at some point, somebody, you know, we have to know which decommission, which PSDAR is being followed, and that's going to be dependent on the license transfer. I guess the question is, at what point does that become a problem relative to the work being done? I would say the work that we are doing right now is work that can be done whether we get that approval or not. So, for example, the next um, major activities, and I have John and Brian here to help me out, uh, is we'll start transitioning some of the systems that are no longer required uh, for um, the post shutdown operation. We can uh, essentially start draining those systems, taking them out of service. So that would happen whether it was Entergy planning on doing this uh, as part of our 60-year scenario or if Holtec was to be approved for their um, uh, <laughs> license transfer application, you know, they would be doing this anyway. So right now, uh, that is not hampering any of the work that we have. We've put together a very detailed schedule of activities that we would be doing right now, um, whether or not that decision comes through uh, successfully or not. So it, it has no impact right now. I guess my question is, how long will that be the case? Yeah. I mean, at, w at what point does, does the NRC have to make a decision so that it goes down one road or the other, or the work stops? I mean, there's got to be a point at which... You know, I, I can't talk specific to Pilgrim, but, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of Vermont Yankee, we shut down at the end of 2014. We didn't transfer the license to North Star until January of this year, and we continued on with decommissioning activities, made progress <coughs> towards completing a lot of the milestones we had so forth. So I, I think we're, we have years of work that we can continue before we would uh, be at a point where all the fuel's on the pad and the plant's in a stable condition to tr transition into safe store or decon. Thank you. Any other? I just, um, Mr. I don't. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Joe and, and I think um, David both said that this, these letters to the EPA and the Stormwater plan are publicly available. Could we just get those sent to us so we don't have to dig for them? I, I can both provide a reference and give you a copy. I have it Thank with you. me. Thank you. That would be appreciated. I'll distribute to everybody. Thank you. And this slideshow, too, I assume? Yeah. Thanks. As usual. Before you leave, um, I don't want you to fall off the carpet or others here in the audience, but unless uh, Paul's got something to say to the contrary, I'd like to just personally compliment you and Entergy uh, for the way you've tried to handle the employee situation. So, Paul, unless you have anything different, everybody that I've talked to feels that you've done everything you possibly could to help make this difficult transition as uh, positive and painless as possible. So, um, we may disagree on some things, but you certainly appear to have done a, as good a job as you could have humanly done. Paul, do you have any? Um, <clears throat> uh, through the chair and to the chair, very well articulated. Of course, it could always be better, okay, and would welcome any thoughts on that. But uh, we are appreciative. I think I can speak for all involved. We're appreciative for what Entergy has done, what Holtec has offered. Um, and especially the, the good Commonwealth of Massachusetts and how they have stepped up, okay, and uh, offered a helping hand out of this, okay? Very good. Chairman. We're thankful. Mr. Chairman, thank yeah. you for the recognition. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is Jeremy. Jeremy here, yeah. And uh, I'm going to also introduce 
Joe? Yes. Good. You can introduce yes, just a moment to take your time. Flip it over. <coughs> Hold on, Joseph. Could everybody hear that? No. People are now leaving silver bracelets around. Okay, we know who it is. Thank you. Can we bid on it? No, it's already been found. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record. And <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, the committee, I uh, appreciate the invitation to come back here, give you a status, hopefully answer any questions that you guys propose tonight, as well as, you know, offer to follow up on those that don't get answered today. The uh, first, first thing I'd like to do is introduce my colleague here. This is Mr. Joe Delmar. He is the senior director of our government affairs as well as our communications. He just started with Holtec two weeks ago. He's been drinking from a fire hose, but I will just say that the experience and the depth of experience that he's already brought to the organization has really helped with us to uh, build a, a posture where we can come out and be more transparent and communicate things a little more thoroughly. So with that, I, w I wouldn't mind if we just have a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to, to the panel, uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, just a little background on myself. Uh, I've s spent the past 11 years working in the nuclear industry, specifically for PSEG, Public Service Enterprise Group in New Jersey, uh, as Director of Communications and Government Affairs for their Salem and Hope Creek nuclear plants, which is the second largest commercial nuclear operating facility in the United States. In that role, handled internal communications, but primarily the focus of my job was working with the local community. Uh, being the voice, uh, working with elected officials from a local level all the way up to a state and federal level, uh, but also working closely with community groups from Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we had a great partnership with the local university and also the local community college as well. So I, I take a lot of pride in the relationships I built there, and I'm looking to do the same here and hope that we can do that as well. Uh, prior to joining PSCG, also spent several years working in New Jersey state government and working with several key legislators as well. Uh, I will say over the, my last year at PSEG, uh, there was a lot of turmoil with the plants. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to keep the plants open and worked with the legislature there to do, develop a legislative solution to provide uh, zero emission credits to keep the plants open. But the, the main focus that I had during that was working with the local community who was a great support and having them engaged in the process. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, the carbon emissions is definitely key. But as someone, you know, these are my coworkers. I was also fighting for my own job. Uh, it's the economic impact and the jobs uh, that really impacts everyone here. And, you know, we're gonna work together. That's our goal and that's my personal goal that we wanna work together with you and with others in the community uh, to do what's best. Uh, Cause this is not just where we're gonna be doing business but also we, we're gonna call this our home as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is this still on? Pat, do you mind getting off your phone? <laughs> so tonight I do want to just give a quick status on what we're doing in the decommissioning planning at the Pilgrim site. Uh, I'd also like to provide a few updates on the NDCAP. But real quick, we, you know, we stress nuclear safety, we stress safety in the workplace. Um, you know, as just a reminder here, we have a lot of cords that lie on the floor here. Stepping up here, there was a really big trip hazard. So just a real, just take a minute, please, and think about, you know, your colleagues that are up here, our people in the audience as well, you know, when we're moving around here, just pay attention to these cords, please. So, Pat, next slide, please. I thought you were gonna offer to give the school a new system so that they can <laughs> yeah. I think you'll be back next time with a roll of the tape <laughs> yeah, was, to tape them down. I was going to say that might get added to a list. <laughs> so first things first, you know, we do want to uh, just offer our recognition to the men and women at, at the Pilgrim site who safely offloaded the fuel. I don't think 
Mr. Lynch emphasized quite a, enough what an accomplishment that was. It was completed ahead of schedule. It was done safely. And I think all of us have been in positions where we're changing occupations or perhaps your employment is changing. Given that that culture was at the site and they still succeeded in doing this safely, I mean, that is a, a very big accomplishment. It's a testament to leadership and as well as the crew that will be transitioning over here. So thank you very much for that. So as of today, Intergy has moved into their phase one organization. We are still on target for shooting the August August 1st transaction date that's obviously pending the NRC approval as I mentioned last time I was here we needed to set that date we had asked the NRC to do a six-month approval time frame on the LTA when we did that we set a date that said we will be prepared to take over the plant regardless of what state it's in by this date that date is still August 1st so when I talk tonight about all of our preparations, pre-planning, things like that. Understand that yes, the, the LTA could be pushed out and that will push the schedule to the right sum, but as far as being prepared and ready to take over this site, we had to set that date and that's where we're set. So the key things we're focused on right now, obviously the change manage initiatives, people are coming first. The current focus is making sure that Entergy uh, has the opportunity to decommission, the, to move into the decommissioning phase one organization at their pace. So Holtec, CDI, we've, we've stood back. We're allowing them, not necessarily allowing them, but we're giving the opportunity to step back and not be interfering with that process. However, we are putting an emphasis on the safety and conduct of activities, uh, keeping the added stress of the employment out of the equation here. So that was always one of the target goals for getting to the August 1st. Next slide, please. So this slide will look very much like the one we gave last time. There are a couple of things that we have done. Obviously, the first bullet there, integrating the site organizations with a decommissioning focus. Uh, as I just stated, we are having this transition period now where the employees are leaving tomorrow. Over the next couple of weeks, we've got a series of announcements that will help prepare the employees for what will inevitably come. Obviously, some of those will be related to employment. We expect many of those to start coming as we clo get closer to the date. And those are things like further emphasis on, on benefits. We'll talk about time sheeting, you know, all those details that it takes to actually run a project or take over a portion of this company, as the case may be here. The integrated corporate site governance, obviously, we talked a little bit last time, you know, when we assume this, it is an equity transfer. So we take on all of that organizational structure, all the policies and procedures that by license we're required to follow to conduct operations. Those carry over into decommissioning. The focus on the successful execution in key transition areas, again, we're focused on staffing, including qualifications and training. Those are big areas. Other areas that'll fall into that is making sure badges and things like that work on day one understanding that there'll be a smooth transition so employees show up they're they're able to get on the site the programs and procedures to maintain the compliance uh, as we stated last time there are thousands of documents that have to be gone through our teams are working together with the site to make sure that those are being transferred safely with part of the organization that the energy is undergoing now you talk Joe talked a little bit about the cold and dark scenarios and taking some systems and laying those up in a safe configuration our teams are working with them, and as they do that, there are certain procedures that will no longer be in practice because those systems will no longer be applicable. There's also a lot of work that goes into that. Some of you may be familiar with lockout, tagouts, and just other safety protocols to ensure your de-energizing systems, getting rid of liquids, getting rid of oils, things like that. Understanding that if you maintain those, it costs money so a lot of these are done for efficiency others are done for safety and some of those are also done to keep your procedures in line with what's required by the license so moving over to the decommissioning planning team focus again there's they are finalizing that decommissioning schedule and finalizing the cost estimate that'll go along with that and we're talking about that it is getting down to a more granular basis of what the cost estimate will be understanding the decommissioning the DCE decommissioning cost estimate that was submitted with the PSDAR had a lot of 
assumptions in there, a lot of contingencies in there. This is now really focused on, again, like I repeat myself from last time, but now we have actual labor rates. We have actual quotes coming in from vendors and suppliers for subcontracts and different scopes of work. So all of that is getting backed into there, and that will give us a, a clearer picture. It also enables us to be more transparent as we go on our annual basis and we report how the status of the project is going in relation to the drawdowns on the trust fund. All of that is really baselined in this new schedule revision. One of the other things I did want to clarify with the decommissioning trust fund, because I think this is a, a point that is often misunderstood. The decommissioning trust fund is used for license termination activities. The exemptions that get filed under that are not necessarily an exemption from a rule. It's more of an exemption to use the funding. You prove that there's enough funding in the trust fund to do these operations. Now, when we talk about how we do these withdrawals, the day Holtec takes ownership, this is not an open bank account. You can't just go in and withdraw money. It is a scenario where you do approved work scopes. Once those approved work scopes have been conducted, those are submitted for approval by the NRC, they sign off, and we are allowed to take the recovery on those things. If there's an item in there that isn't a recoverable, it won't be allowed to withdraw. So it's a very regulated process for drawing down what you can pull out of that trust fund. So moving forward here, validating the readiness of CDI programs and procedures. This is really more to that integration of understanding CDI will be taking on that general contracting role with the decommissioning project. So understanding how that governance will actually apply the cultural shift as we bring in the energy professionals and leadership to help out with that site as it goes forward. It's adopting that and bringing those two cultures together. So that's really what that is geared towards. Finalizing the CDI vendor contracts and decommissioning activities. Obviously, there are large scope works that are going to be subcontracted out during this. Uh, last time I mentioned reactor segmentation, for example. I do want to emphasize that during that time, similar to what the plant has gone through in outages, where you've had an influx of professionals who come in to support those activities, decommissioning will be very much the same way. So you will have these other work groups that come in. They will hire local labor, some of those external union labor, to support those works as we go forward. While they're here for those durations, and they could be one month, they could be eight months, they could be as long as a year, those people will be here in hotels, in restaurants, and you know, supporting the community as well. When we talk about support for execution of physical plant changes, as I was talking earlier when with reference to Mr. Lynch setting the condition of the cold and dark. Obviously, uh, to Mr. Wolf's comment, the, the, the activities that can happen right now, obviously they're going into safe store if it continues with Entergy's license, correct? The activities that we'll be doing in that same period are very similar. The emphasis is safely securing the fuel on the pad. Those activities will remain the same, whether it's a decon approach or the safe store. Now, understanding that the LTA is not necessarily the mechanism for allowing the decommissioning process to happen, that is purely for the license and the equity transition. So those two things are not tied together. And I believe that is the last slide. Now, I know that... Uh, my colleague had some updates that he wanted to give in relation to some of the other activities that Holtec and CDI are involved with. I could just ask that that be provided to us in electronic form so we can put it uh, on yes, the website. Yes, sir. Just uh, one update uh, following along some of the mirror activities with some of the other plants that we are in the process of acquiring. Uh, earlier this week, the NRC commissioners did rule on the contentions for the Oyster Creek um, license transfer. Um, they found that there was, um, there was no uh, contentions per their process, uh, and we anticipate hopefully within the next two weeks to uh, get the license transfer in Oyster Creek and complete that process. Um, with that, our, our target to uh, complete the sale and the acquisition is in early July uh, with Exelon for the Oyster Creek plant. So looking at the progress and the timing of that and the timing that we, we've stated for Pilgrim, uh, we feel comfortable with the time frames that we have there and barring any unforeseen circumstances. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, 
So you're thinking that you will be able to meet the August 1st deadline? Is that what you're thinking? That is, that is our goal still, correct. Based on what you saw with Oyster Creek with the NRC? Ba based on that, you know, other things could come up during that, you know, if the NRC, you know, decides. But, you know, based on, you know, how that process went through, you know, we're, we're confident with that date. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Right. Yes, all, all of those do remain on the plant, and they do get inherited. To clarify the equity transfer, what that really means is we're transitioning the entirety of what happens at Pilgrim now. To maintain that license, the programs, the procedures, things that fall in line behind that, all of those transition over. Those will not change. Now, over time, as there's some different downgrades and things like that in perimeter, as you well know, you were at the plant these things will modify but as far as adoption from day one they will be the same policies and procedures Richard? jeremy earlier this year andrea sturgis was um giving an update regarding what you were talking about today and i asked the question about the decommissioning cost estimate and timeline in terms of uh, the 25 MR NRC cl uh, cleanup standard versus if a 10 MR cleanup standard had to be attained uh, based on MOU negotiations or something going on behind the scenes there. And um, a couple days ago, um, Sean distributed uh, uh, an email received from Joyce McMahon regarding a number of questions that were raised over the last several months. And um, that particular question uh, that I raised, um, at the time, jo um, Andrea said that the decommissioning cost us an eight-year timeline was uh, based on very conservative assumptions. So she was implying to my question that uh, there probably wouldn't or shouldn't be any significant impact. Uh, at least that was my interpretation. But at least in the response that Joyce provided uh, representing Holtec International, that uh, it was strictly based on the 25 MR. So my question is, um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'll put you on a little spot here. Do you, feel, do you feel that there could be some impact regarding decommissioning cost and uh, eight-year schedule if you had to shrink down to the 10 mm -hmm. MR? And uh, um, what can you tell us about that? So what I can say is when, when Ms. Sturtis was here and she had spoken to that measure, we had done a basis analysis to say whether or not that could be achieved. Given the conservatism that was in the decommissioning cost estimate at the time, we were very confident that that could be a, attained without having to change things or move the schedule to the right. Now, part of, like I was saying today, you know, we're going back, we're doing this detailed estimate to really find out what is the bottom line. Now, we have not completed those things, so making a commitment at this stage is obviously something I'm not prepared to stand up here and say. I will say that it is a consideration that we've taken very seriously because it is a, a, a concern of the Commonwealth, and we are looking at that option now. So, and it is part of what we're doing. Senator? Yeah, I'm curious as, just because of so much uh, often what plays out in outcomes and operational outcomes is related to the financing, the business plan, et cetera. I'm wondering to the degree that there is available either a prospectus on the business end or a business plan relative to the expectations for the investor side as opposed to accountability relative to the NRC or the public on what happens to the decommissioning trust fund. <coughs> I'm really interested that we understand, you know, the whole thing, follow the money that we really understand what the shareholder expectations are and how they're going to be met. Because from my experience, that does to a large degree uh, often play out, especially when there are pressures introduced. And especially if it turns out that, you know, the concern of a lot of people here is that there is isn't not sufficient funds, how that's all going to work. And I, I still am not 100 percent sure 
the, not that I need to look at them and, and scrutinize them, but that somebody uh, in the interest of the public and the citizens uh, have an opportunity to scrutinize that, not just the investors or the corporations that are involved. And I'm just wondering the degree to which we're ever going to see that or have a right or an opportunity to see it. Would you, uh, it's pretty easy, would you share with us? So I'm not, there, were, there seemed like a few questions in there. What I, what I will clarify for you, and this is, this is going to be public record from here until we time we finish the decommissioning. Annually, we will be making that report to the NRC, and that will be a disclosure that we will bring here and discuss with the NDCAP panel as well to talk about where the funding sources are going. Now, to, to sort of shore that up without really getting into an area that I cannot discuss at this point, what I will say is the entire point of this is to come here and tell you about the activities that we're currently undergoing while we go through the decommissioning. We will give you the forecast of what is coming up, which we have done this whole time. The activities to date, we will status those. And we will be disclosing when we found some things that, that weren't unexpected. I mean, that is part of this process of being clear and transparent with the panel. Now, how those corrective actions go into place, and sorry, Mr. Priest, uh, I just mentioned corrective actions is a, a different term. It has a different connotation in nuclear, as you would well know in aviation, right? But as these things do show themselves, we will have plans and pathways to recover that. And it's part of the annual report. If, in fact, we are falling short of that expectation or that forecast, we have to prove and validate that with the NRC that we can still continue this project before they'll allow it to go forward. Would you like me to pursue it or do you want to pursue it? No, I guess. Uh, let me just try a, a different approach. There's, I think, $1.04 billion, $1.040 billion currently is there as a result of the investment and what's changed. What happens if, if, if the cost is only $900 million? What happens to the difference between the $1.040 billion and the $900 million? Where does that money go? So you're asking the question, if there's money remaining in the fund, mm -hmm. where does that money go? That would go to Holtec. Yeah, okay. That would, in fact, and go to I think, I think what the uh, Senator's point was, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that having some visibility into what, because um, there's a lot of money here. You guys are going to be out in front of a lot of money as you go back for what essentially is a reimbursement upon completion and NRC review mm -hmm. and approval. That's a lot of cash flow. These are big numbers. Uh, and that requires investment. Nobody's got that in petty cash. And I think what the senator, would, correct me again if I'm wrong, was saying it would help all of us understand a little bit better if the sources of that funding, we don't need to know who's investing necessarily, but to understand, all right, what are the, what are the expectations? I mean, is the expectation a 35 percent return on the investment because it's so high risk but it's high reward? You know, that, that's what I think you're asking, right? That and we all need to understand that based on that business model, there is an absolute pressure oh, to spend absolutely. less money, not from you guys, but on behalf of the investors. Of course. Because the investors end up getting more at the end, the less money that's spent sure. on behalf of the citizens. That is an inherent contradiction, in my opinion, in the entire intent of the decommissioning trust fund and this process. And I'm sorry. I mean, I, I almost consider it immoral. And that's not a slap at you guys, okay? You didn't set up the structure. You didn't approve it. It's, as I've said in here before, that is an abject failure of government, in my opinion. But that's what it is. They're a private company. There Mary, are no Mary? Investors. Mary. Mary. Could, could I respond to the peanut gallery? <laughs> okay. I mean, if we got to get into this, that's completely irrelevant to the point I'm making. A private company, by the way, has investors, Mary, okay? They do. So, okay. thank you. Any other questions? Through the chair. Uh, just a quick, Jeremy and Joe, thank you very much for your presentation. A quick question. Uh, we have a PSDAR for DECON from you. Yes. We have a PSDAR from Entergy for a safe store. We have an August 1st date, which you're going to take over the license and the transfer. Will that... <coughs> Go ahead, Jeremy. I was just going to say, uh, understandably, that's an anticipated date based on our 
what we had ideally hoped would happen. But it's consistent with your schedule in the yes, PSCA. Yes, it is. It is. It is. That. Yes, sir. And we can't control the day. So the question I have is, <clears throat> up to August 1st, assuming that's the date, Entergy will be able to take out of the Nuclear de Decommissioning Trust Fund to compensate for its uh, expenses. Will you be able to also, and will Entergy, before the August 1st date, and then after the August 1st date, will Entergy also be able to recover some of its expenses incurred prior to August 1st, after August 1st, through you to the in, uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Trust Fund? So I think to clarify Mr. Lynch's point, what the NRC set that cap, that 3% cap up to a certain measure, which was the minimum available trust. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to repeat what, what you were saying. Um, there is a cap on that. So anything that happened prior to the start of decommissioning, it's capped. So there wouldn't be a withdrawal coming down a year down the road to recover anything. The other side of that coin is if the license were to transfer over to Holtec, there's not a pathway for Entergy to go back and recover those. The license would sit with Holtec. And just, just to suggest, Rich, to clarify it, Jeremy, the August 1st date, if I remember exactly what you said, you'll be prepared as an organization as of August 1st. Yes, sir. You're also prepared, if it comes out to be next August 1st, to continue to do those activities. So the August 1st date is what's in the PSDAR. It was to try to encourage the NRC to act quickly in keeping with what you've seen elsewhere. So it's not necessarily August 1st, <coughs> Rich, that it'll happen. Right, right. Will there Will there be uh, regular changes to the PSDAR for DECON after August 1st if the as the numbers come in as you execute contracts you know how much let's say decontamination is going to cost will you be adjusting those figures as we go along or is that so I think with any whether it be an EPC contract a demolition project something of these natures you're going to have those things that do change throughout how we address those will be an annual basis annual. to come back in and say that. Now, I can tell you this, with the efficiency of these companies and, and with so much at stake, it will not take a year for somebody to respond to course correct. During that process, again, though, we will be here to talk through those things. You know, this was originally the ND cap was a quarterly. Now it's a monthly. So every 30 days. It could be I, weekly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may not have all the support for that. Daily. However, you know, but again, with that same token, I, you all have our information. You are more than welcome to contact us at any point. Uh, Mr. Mullen knows that. He's, he's already phoned me up a couple of times and, and expressed the concerns and some of the things that we need to come forward with. And I'm fully committed to meeting those expectations of the chairman, as well as the rest of the committee. As we can divulge this information, we will certainly come out and be transparent with that. But I do encourage all of you, and if it does require certain task groups to come invite us in to get into some of the complex matters where we can sit down and really have real discussions and explain things, that's also an opportunity for us to clarify some of these activities. Because it is a very complex the NRC rulemaking, the NRC regulations, the other regulations that we're going to have to stand up to within the state. As you can see around when we talk about certain activities, even with this committee, there's, there's sometimes disagreement in what the rules are. So I think we have to keep this dialogue open. I believe it's going to take some of these breakout sessions for us to work together to get to the answers that you need. John? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First, just really an observation and then a comment and a question. Um, you know, I think probably the majority of folks sitting around this table have been in the public sector for a number of years, whether it be in state government, federal government, local, um, people who have worked on the environmental side as well as the business side. You know, my experience as part of this committee and listening to Holtec and listening to Entergy and listening to the NRC, I've never seen three entities get along so well in my entire life. Uh, I hear of no concerns. I hear of no weaknesses. It's like we're in the land of Oz. Um, what are the concerns? What are the issues from Holtec's perspective as well as Entergy's? I never hear anything negative at these meetings. Everything is just wonderful. Uh, the employees are going to move on. Uh, everyone's doing what they need to do at the state level. 
there's no negatives. There's a few comments here and there, but what are the areas of concern from Holtec's perspective? Where are the weaknesses? I've heard nothing but the strengths. I'm not asking for a SWOT analysis, but what's, where are your issues of concern? You want to take that? For, for me, as someone two, two and a half weeks so in, no, <laughs> no, I, I think for, for me and, and my background, and, and Pat O'Brien and I have known each other for a couple of years from, from a communications perspective and building trust and transparency, what's involved in that. And for, for us, it's, there are no surprises. And you know, making sure that we have processes in place, we're adopting procedures and things like that. But there's also lessons learned along the way. And you know, Pat has the experience at Pilgrim. I have the experience at PSEG. Some of the other plants, Oyster Creek. You know, what are those scenarios? What are those challenges that that we need to get in front of from a from a public perception, a communication perspective? Because my goal ultimately is. You know, if we have an issue come up, you know, we're going to raise it here at a meeting. But in between meetings, we need to let you know what's going on. And we want to make sure that we're reaching out to the right people and we're providing the information. And there may be some tough conversations, but I'd rather have that tough conversation up front versus down the line where you're hearing it from a reporter or someone else and, and doing that. So for me, one of the things coming in is looking at the processes and procedures, you know, engaging Pat, engaging some others from our perspective on hey, we need to work with the community. We know to do that. You know, where are the challenges that several of us have faced over the years working at different plants um, from an operating perspective now to decommissioning perspective? Um, I, I've worked with boards on these. I, I've tried to anticipate, but there's always something that's going to come up that you don't anticipate. And, you know, our job is to be open and transparent. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in, you know, the whole tech name. I wouldn't have joined the organization, but also it's my own personal integrity. And I, you know, I sit up here today and in the future, I, I want you to trust me and I will do my best to, to provide, tr you know, honest information. And if I don't have the answer, I'm not going to make it up. I will get back to you. And if I can't, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I can. So, so what threats and risks have you anticipated relative to Holtec taking over as of August 1st that you're concerned about? I don't have the as, as the depth of knowledge as Jeremy does on specific things, but from a people perspective, you know, we, we talk about notifications from from the emergency planning standpoint, the emergency plan changes that are going to be made. You know, we still to make sure that we maintain those relationships, we communicate with key people, and, and have that information out there. Second. Thank you, Joe. Pine's going first. Now, I, I would actually like to take a stab at this as well, because my background is somewhat different than Mr. Delmar's and, and some of the other colleagues in government affairs and communication. My background is actually in hands-on packaging waste. It is moving large amounts of waste across highways, putting it in disposal cells, making sure that the personal protective equipment is up to par. It is making sure that the road and traffic patterns are up to par. So when I look at things like that and i look at you know fuel to me is is sort of a known danger it is very safe it is very regulated there is tons of oversight that's not my concern my concern are the day-to-day -day activities and logistics on a site when you have people who are doing multiple activities under very prescript procedures on taking things apart somebody not paying attention my biggest concern is that we've got a bureaucracy that doesn't allow us to have the appropriate engagement points with a community to plan logistics, to plan some of the concerns of the community that say, actually, you know, it might be beneficial if this road goes this direction instead of this direction. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of contention causing a problem. So that is why I took the job of working in communications to engage with these communities and make these things right. It is also my commitment on the site, having been there, holding the shovel, running the big crane that loads canisters onto a train full of nuclear waste. These are my concerns, that we're paying attention to details, that we're making sure that that's done safely. And that comes with all of the pre-preparation that we're doing right now. Now on day one, we don't go right into dismantling things. We have that period of waiting for the Zerk fire window to close to load fuel into canisters. During that time frame, there is a lot of preparation 
Decommissioning is not going to knock down buildings, rip stuff out. It is a very surgical process. There is not one nut or bolt taken out of a machine that doesn't have a work plan put in place. Everything has somebody standing around as a safety observer or a rad technician to make sure that there's no exposure to those people. My biggest fear is that that gets overlooked at any step of the way. Now my confidence is gained in the fact that we have a crew of people here who have gone through a column four, constant scrutiny. They have been faced with adversity. They know their plant is going away. They know their jobs are going away. That has given me more confidence going into this project than any other project I've been involved with because I've done it successfully. And this offloading of this fuel safely is a testament to that. Fine. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everything you said there, and I agree with you. Um, where I come from is, um, is that for people to be safe, the environment has to be healthy. And I would like to know um, if you are now taking steps to investigate the site for yourself, or if you are relying on the information that we haven't been able to see from Entergy yet, um, and if not, it, what's your time schedule on that, and can we sit down and talk when you do? I think the answer to that is there will be opportunity for us to talk about that process. And I think to provide that confidence, as I was just saying, everything that goes through has a work plan. The assessment will be going on to evaluate the situation for now. As you move something out of the way inside the plant, a big piece of equipment, you're going to discover what was under it that hadn't been seen for 40 years potentially, right? And at that point, there will be further analysis to figure out whether that's a danger to the workers, to the environment, or anything in that category in between. You're also looking for the long-term consequence or ripple effect that something else might have happened in relation to that. So it will not be something that you walk in and you say, hey, based on what we know today, we're good to go. It is a constant assessment of the situation, it is a constant assessment of the impacts to the environment, and that includes the traffic patterns coming into the space. What impact are we going to do there? So it is an ongoing effort. There will be opportunities to work with the community to discuss those factors. Um, Ms. Dubois, I think you would be a great person to have a lot of these conversations with. Well, I do have a lot of questions, and I, and I do live in the area and do experience the changes that are taking place right now. And I'm assuming that you're not from the area, either of you, and that you don't have that experience. Um, and I also feel that, you know, the level of our information isn't all that great, generally. And so, you know, for you to put a plan for decommissioning, I, I absolutely support the rapid decommit, absolutely support it. But I also want to know that it's going to absolutely work for all of us, that we're going to really clean it up, and we're going to deal with those, you know, rising water table levels in a timely manner so that when you get down there and it floods, you know what to do. That's, that's the kind, without just pumping it into the bay, if you want, if you read me. No, I, I, I Thank you. So if you can g give us a schedule for when you start that, that assessment, um, you know, and what it, what it entails, we would be appreciative. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and to, to just add a little bit more to that. Do you want me to go next? I actually grew up in the southwest, in the southeast. Will you be the, quick? The environmental impacts of things that happen in my community because of uranium mining. I actually sat in the seat, the, the peanut gallery, as Senator Wolf had mentioned. I sat there protesting all of these things for years. So I actually took a stance that said, I want to be involved in solving the problem. And where in the southeast was that? Moab, Utah. Utah. Utah is southeast? Southwest. I'm in the southeast now. <laughs> Richard. Jeremy, a quick follow-up to uh, John's question and also touching a bit on Joe's presentation, Entergy Update. In the... I'd like to say unlikely event, there is a very long duration of the NRC deciding on the license transfer, and Entergy were to get to the point of decommissioning, putting the plant into safe store, how does this impact Holtec International or not in terms of uh, getting it out of safe store and getting into the act of decommissioning? 
uh, as opposed to if the license transfer took place uh, more quickly and the plant was not in safe store. So it could very well impact our goal of committing to the eight years, right, or the goal to reach the partial site release within the eight years. So it could push things to the right. It could have an impact on some of the funding availability at the time. However, I believe most of what is represented in both cost estimates, you'll see those numbers aligned. The scopes of work that we're talking about with the spent fuel movements over the next two to three years, all of that is, is parallel from one to the other. So you're talking about the same spend profile as well as with the resources on site. Ready for all possibilities. And yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you through the chair. I, I had uh, tried to involve myself earlier after Mr. Grassi. It, uh, it, it had to do with this billion dollars. Okay, and we, we, we hear comments that there's, the billion dollars is much too much and there's going to be exorbitant profits made off of it. And we also hear comments that it's, it's, it's not going to be enough and uh, the state is going to have to kick in. But, uh, we, we have to consider that in the rate base, which uh, came from the regulated arena in the late 90s when, when Pilgrim was originally sold from Boston Edison, a 100-year-old utility, to Entergy, that, that was what was determined w what the decommissioning trust fund would be. And it was to get it to this point of $1.04 billion, which, which is in the eyes of the state who, who looked at it with the multiple utilities that have since bought it, the multiple companies, it's, it's conservative. I think possibly some profit. I imagine that's, that, that's why it's sought after. That's why these units are being picked up in the deregulated states. But uh, probably not exorbitant because over the years it's had to provide the electricity and the community has had to put into it. So it's been subject to state regulation, forecasting, and justification. So I, I think we as a board should, should recognize it. We're, go, we're going to hear arguments on either end of it, okay, but a billion dollars is a significant sum. Let me just uh, wrap up this portion. Put one, one more. Go ahead, Kev. You go first and we'll wrap up. Sorry to jump in late here. Um, thanks for coming. I just wanted to refer to the uh, document that we got uh, responses to our questions, uh, specifically item six where you say you're actively engaged with the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Are you at liberty to expand on that? Uh, uh, how, how's that going? How, you know, how many meetings have you had? Any? I'll, I'll just say from my personal perspective, I, I've been up here the past couple days and met with different people. We did have a, a meeting um, with uh, Chairman Tavares, but unfortunately had to cancel at the last minute. But, you know, our goal is to have a conversation with, with the town as much as possible and engage them. Again, it's, you know, yes, you know, we're running a business, but also we want to do what's right for the community. So we, we will have ongoing conversations with them as well as other groups, including this, this panel, to, to engage input on that. So, but I, I don't have a lot of details as I haven't met with them personally myself, but you know, the, our goal is to, to meet with them on a routine basis. Has there been a formal response to their, their list of requests? So let, me, let me just state this. So we have met with Mr. Tavares and others. Uh, in fact, we met with them the day after the last NDCAP meeting. Uh, Ms. Re, I know I'm probably ruining that name, She's Miss Arigi. Miss Arigi. Yes. She's 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 definitely expressed a lot of what the selectmen are looking for. Today, just out of coincidence, we happened to be at another meeting uh, at the city house. Uh, we were able to have a little bit of discussion. I think we're getting to a point where we're really understanding some of the concerns of the community, specifically in relation to what the property is intended use would be. So. I would say that we're, we're actively engaged. It's only by happenstance this time that we couldn't follow up. There are a number of uh, discussions that we've had related to just the pilot tax commitments, verifying that you know, once this equity transfer goes through, all of that will come over and we've signed up for that. We are looking for a mechanism that actually states that. However, just understanding how the equity transfer works, it's, it's not just a purchase of a license, for example, it is actually taking over that entity. 
So all of those things are contractual obligations that we will accept. Furthermore, we are aware of some of the water issues now that was brought up at the uh, selectman meeting that we had and we are actively uh, today I think we got some some good points for Miss Arigi to go back and talk to our leadership and say hey these are these are the genuine concerns and these are the benefits to the community up to now it's been a lot of speculation on you know would you do this would you do that but now that we're actively engaged I believe we'll make some progress w will there be a formal response to the uh, f list that you got from the selectmen previously presented in public or is that just uh, well ongoing so to be fair I don't know that we've actually received a formal we, we received a document that came from here okay and the discussions we that we have that. been having with the select board have actually steered toward other th topics that they've brought up and we've asked them to bring those to us and talk about those has there been any other community outreach done No, apologize if I butcher some names here, but no, just over um, the, the past couple days, um, had the opportunity to, to meet with uh, Representative Moratori, um, also uh, Senator DiMaceto, uh, also met with uh, Congressman Keating's staff today as well. So um, for me personally, working with the chamber is, is something that, you know, I value working with the local business community in the past and engaging, you know, the impact on local businesses as well. So look forward to additional opportunities with other groups and definitely welcome feedback um, on other groups that you suggest that we possibly meet with as well. And up till now, we have also been engaged with MEMA and a couple of the other offices prior to the petition where we no longer could engage. Uh, but Entergy was kind enough to invite us along with many of these introductions and that relationship but I think the other thing to keep in mind too there are a lot of commitments that until we actually are the license holder we we aren't in a position to go state that yes we can commit to X Y and Z which uh, brings me to my closing remarks on, on this first I uh, thank you very much for attending uh, thank you for taking my phone calls you'll get more um, and I thank you for beginning to engage this is an improvement but let me try to summarize what I think might be the overall arching uh, problem concern here the words like transparency are used frequently to date there has been no transparency you've read and I know you went back because we talked about this you went back and looked at every transcript and every minutes and you saw your colleague now one question after another including all of the 15 specific things we wouldn't answer it wouldn't answer it now you guys do a much better job though, and I'm not criticizing Andrea but you're better at it you got more experience in that line that's not transparency guys it's much better public relations it's much better approach to it but it's not transparency so when we're asking questions about as you'll hear the concerns well there's not enough money or you're gonna make too much profit those two things both can't be true and the best way to lay it out on the table is to say and I think we could take a poll. We're all capitalists here. Most of us are business guys. We expect you to make money. We want you to make money. But we don't want you to make money at the sake of the safety and doing it right. You guys agree with that. The best way to convince us is to have a little transparency, is to simply say, no, look, guys, here's what we're doing. Here's what we've got set aside for this portion. Now, we may get a subcontractor that gives us a different estimate. We may find stuff, as Pine said, under the floor. Hey, that happens. Anybody that's ever done a renovation in the house, it happens. We get that. That's okay. But what we need is to learn a little bit more of that granularity that you're talking about. I'm not looking for your detailed profit margins, but we need that assurance. That's transparency. What we've gotten to this point, and I, I really applaud you guys coming back into it. You've read all the past minutes. It hasn't been transparency. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And we will stick around if there are more questions. And please get us copy electronically. You can send it to me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to go on briefly to the uh, item eight on the agenda, the annual report. Uh, as many of you, because we've talked individually, know uh, the group, the working groups, have been doing the best they can to put this together. We, uh, we've lived this dream before last year. <laughs> Uh, we have no administrative clerical support 
And without getting into this level of granularity, um, I'm going to give a suggestion on how we handle this over the next week and then the next month. But just trying to handle five or six different inputs and bring that into a <coughs> Word document where this is not what any of us do for a living, and you have a formatting issue because we're trying to create a professional report, um, and we went through the same thing last year. Joe has put tens of hours in. Rich has put tens of hours in. Fine. Kevin, every, everybody involved has put a lot of time in. But when you try to bring this one document together, and even down to the version of Microsoft Word that it's been used on, you import one paragraph. What, are you grinning over there, Pine? Hmm. You input one paragraph, and everything goes sideways. So um, it's the truth. It's a difficult problem. So here's what my suggestion is, and if the, uh, if the panel is in, in agreement, we don't need a vote or anything. Uh, much as I ended up doing last year, I would like to take what Joe has provided me with, which is the assemblage of this with all sorts of, if any of you have ever turned on the uh, track changes and then looked at the actual embedded codes that are embedded in Jack, seeing, I mean, how many hours did you spend last year on this? I'm going to do it on Saturday. I hope it rains like a bastard. I'm going to do it on Saturday, and I'm going to unbundle this thing. And if I have to go back to ASCII, I'm going back to ASCII to get this thing straight. And I will, over the next week, send out to all of you our best attempt at this new draft so that you guys can then have three weeks to look at it before we get together in July, if that's acceptable to you. I'm hoping that you'll say, no, Sean, we want to do it ourselves. But um, in, the, in, the, in the absence of that, is that acceptable? The document. The document. The document. Yeah. yeah. We're beyond the outline at this point. Okay. I assumed that was. Yeah. Just Joe, I mean, you've been sort of leading. Is that acceptable to you? Absolutely. Richard? It's fine. Jack? Kevy? Pine? Don't? <laughs> I'll be calling you, My Pine. Best. I'll be My calling best. you. You could give it to me in Crayola. I don't care. My best. All right. So that's acceptable? That's the way we'll proceed. Which now gives me time to bring up another topic that was not on the agenda, but I was going to do it on a new business, which is the topic of the legislation that's pending, all of the legislation, because as um, one of our fine, concerned citizens said to me recently in an email, our agenda for this evening was slightly jam-packed, and we're not through it yet, and she was right. Uh, but I want you folks in the public to know we have been talking about this and we have been looking at this. We haven't had time to do it. Here's what I'd like to suggest uh, for the July meeting that we once again, as we did, John, when you were kind enough to put the meeting together down the Cape for us, and we had the legislative delegation and the federal guys in, I'd like to invite them in for July during that meeting to talk through this in specific. Now, I know the concerns about committee hearings that might be going on, and we have not as a group had the time to really discuss whether we want as a panel to even make a motion, do we endorse one or not the other? We haven't had time to do that. We just haven't had time. Yeah, most everybody here has got a life other than this. And um, what I'm hoping to do is to create a forum at that next meeting in July. And I know, Senator, I'm stealing some of your thunder because you wanted to go through it. But what I'm suggesting that we do is an alternative is to bring in some of the decision makers, some of the people that are involved. Is that okay by everybody? Is that enough? You'll get a chance to talk then, too. I mean, do Just try to stop me. <laughs> uh, I, I guess my concern is to what end? It, when I do the math and I subtract out the folks from Entergy, which probably we will, would expect not to vote on taking a position on legislation, I take out the state agency representatives, do we have 11? No. 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 Then, no but then here's, here's, I, just, we'll I think it's important that we understand, mm -hmm. and I think as individuals we can go and testify, yeah. and we can hope that the chairs do. I, I certainly hope that folks from the interagency working group mm -hmm. are willing to testify or at least get involved in some of this legislation because they're really coming up to speed on, on some of the, you know, the granular nature of what we're working on. But I, I, want, I think we should do it. Yeah. But I think we all need to go in eyes wide open. Yeah. We're not going to get to get uh, enough. Uh, motive force here to, to vote to testify on any of this or even weigh in on any of it, unless I'm missing something. I, I don't think you are, Senator. I think uh, it might be of um, great value uh, if we need to do such a thing 
to have uh, everybody's vote on record that they would not want to be supportive of some of what is clearly great legislation. And I think that would be of equal importance <coughs> to educate the public as to what people are thinking. Yes, ma'am. When you speak to the Attorney General, Mr. Chairman, would you mind pointing out the fact that the state employees are barred from voting on such things and Entergy has such a conflict that they can't and therefore we would never have that kind of a quorum, mm -hmm. please? This topic's been mentioned, but not to the Attorney General, so it'll, it'll be mentioned. Is that acceptable to everybody that has approached? Paul, did you want to Paul, make a comment? Oh, I only want to uh, uh, agree yeah. with okay. Heinz's comment. Yeah. That is why the board was made up as it was. They wanted to be an advisory board. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I agree. Any other questions, Joe? Yeah, I think it, I, I agree with the Senator's uh, uh, concerns. <coughs> um, I think it raises, bringing the folks at the next meeting is great, but whether the, whether there ever would be a, a um, it's 11 votes. number 11 to uh, support any pieces of legislation, I think it raises also the question before that of uh, is it appropriate or would be it, sure. would it be appropriate for this panel to get into the business of commenting on pending legislation. That's an entirely appropriate con It's a separate Absolutely. issue, but I think it's a very important Absolutely. issue. Absolutely, and that's gotta be taken up as well. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Mr. Johnson can confide in us. Uh, is it the independent working group's uh, strategy to not pass the legislation, but rather have it and the Attorney General sitting there as their leverage uh, so that they can get wh whatever it is they that they want. Brings us government separation thing. I mean, what we're trying to do is decommission the the plant. You have the panel's recommendation to the IWG. Certainly, they're going to be the judges to to the governor, and then the regulating agencies are going to regulate, you know, and we're going to decommission. So, but, you know, all this is is really just posturing with the legislation and the intervention. I'd, I'd respectfully disagree on that. There's some very uh, critical pieces in this of just the legislation that we have in this packet that warrant not only legislative attention but our attention as this panel because that's what we, so for once, Paul, I'm actually going to respectfully disagree with you. Now, whether or not the panel should take a formal vote on it, that's a different story. Uh, but I certainly understand you know, from, from Bobby to Robert to Jack to David, this is, they're employees of the Commonwealth and the agencies. They can't go off testifying in committees with right. the blessing of their employer. I mean, I get that. So I, I think we just put it off for the next meeting. Part of the discussion, I think, is correctly, do we want to take an issue with it? Do we want to vote on it? And I'm not sure we do. Maybe let's hear from the elected officials and see what happens. Yes. One Senator. last comment. One There's last. nothing to preclude anybody here oh, no. from going and either testifying or meeting <coughs> legislators, which sometimes is more effective yep. than testifying at a committee hearing, yep. to say, I sit on this panel, I don't represent the panel, panel mm -hmm. but I have learned a lot in my two or three years on the panel, and here's where I think we are on this piece of legislation. That is actually very Absolutely. helpful. Absolutely. I would encourage people to think about doing that as individuals if we can't come to. Yeah. This, no, this legislation, by the way, it speaks to the exact issues that we're taught, we've been talking about for two years. Mm -hmm. It goes to public safety, it goes to fiscal responsibility, it goes to accountability, and it goes to process and decommissioning. So it's exactly what we're talking about and the IWG is talking about, and it's very consistent and very relevant. Well, then next, next month I'm going to call on you to set the tone for this discussion at the beginning. Sounds like fun. All right. Next Chuck? one. Yes. Have there been any hearings established relative to this legislation? <laughs> There's been a couple of committee hearings so far, but it hasn't advanced very far. So. And these will be refiled again. I mean, this is, you know, the, I just, I want to get Joe Lynch's agreement on a couple of the money ones that after that we can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only saying. Uh, we're going to go on to. Um, the nominations and elections for chair and vice chair, and, and you've now got a great opportunity to really change the direction of this if you want. So are there any nominations for chair and vice chair? Mr. Chairman, I, I, rec I 
would nominate uh, Kevin O'Reilly and Sean Mullen to continue in your positions respectively as chair and vice chair. I would second, second. that. Uh, guys don't want to think about it. <laughs> any, any, any other? Uh, any other? Yes, yeah, this is a group of very night. bright people. <laughs> any discussion? I agree. Uh, thank you, All Richard. those in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Did you vote for me? I did. <laughs> Goodness. Brian? I abstain. Okay. Old business. Any that we haven't talked about? Hearing none. New business. Any that we haven't talked about? Okay. Then we're on to public comment, and we are not going to cheat you because we've gone a little long. So uh, our usual process, and um, Joe, you in particular may not have seen this routine before, but we do it a little different than some meetings. How many people of the public would like to speak this evening? I'm going to go left to right tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we're going to make it, um, let's do it 21 minutes rather than the 15 we had all allocated. So it will be uh, three minutes apiece. And Henrietta, why don't we start with you tonight on that side? Make sure to uh, say your name and uh, Good evening, everybody. I'm Henrietta Cosentino. I am a resident of Plymouth, about five miles, a little less from Pilgrim. Why don't you? Oh, I think your yeah. went off. Oh, you it's might. not on. Does that? OK, yeah. there it goes. Uh, Henrietta Cosentino, resident of Plymouth, uh, member of the board of the Plymouth Area League of Women Voters, and chair of their Nuclear Affairs Committee. And oh my, let me see. Uh, first, I, I want you to know that, that there was a hearing last week, and many of us in the public were there representing our various entity, en entities and uh, testifying in support of bills that were try that were whose intention was to, um, in to guarantee the safety of decommissioning in terms of financial um, solvency for the Commonwealth in terms of proper uh, radiological standards for site cleanup and so forth. Um, what I think is important for the panel and for the representatives of Holtec here tonight to realize is that we, the members of the public, who are not on the panel but who come faithfully to the hearing, to the, to the panel meetings, are still extremely concerned about the details of decommissioning. We are still very concerned about what we think is the inadequacy of the trust fund, given the experience of other decommissioning, such as at Vermont Yankee. We are still very concerned, especially concerned, about the quality of the Holtec um, casks and of their siting. We feel it's very, very important for, we're very grateful that they are going to be moved to higher ground. That's good. But it is not sufficient. Um, I have a question, for example. Are there to date any extra casks large enough to fit over the current casks since the current casks cannot be repaired should they leak? Are there any, any cover casks on site, and if not, will there be some? That's just a question for anybody who can answer it, whether Entergy or Holtec. Okay. Thank you, Henrietta. I don't think there's anybody here that's going to venture to guess at that, right? Well, it shouldn't be a matter of guessing, I would think. It should be a matter of <laughs> they're either there or they're not. I, you know, I, I can't speak for Holtec, who is yeah. a cast designer, but they have said that one of the methodologies for a leaking cask is to construct an overpack. Right. And because the um, type of events that would lead to some sort of a, a leak would be slow and something that could be uh, addressed over a period of time, I would imagine that one could be constructed, and they've already talked about the fact that that is one of the methods to address this. So it, it's not like a catastrophic thing. It's, it's something that you can plan for. So uh, I think this was all covered in previous uh, presentations by 
uh, Dr. Anton and others from not Hofer. not really with all due respect it wasn't covered it, we weren't told that it would be no problem and it could be constructed it would be much more comforting to to know that there were a couple already constructed on site it would also be very comforting to know that there was a plan to cover these casks which if they are 300 feet from the road will still be visible and lined up like bowling balls or like bowling pins just waiting for someone to lob something at them. It would be comforting to know those things. Those are important for our security. <coughs> we are also absolutely very, very concerned about the climate crisis and the environmental crisis. Um, Pine has constantly reminded everybody of the rising waters of the bay. We are concerned about our sole source aquifer, which is still um, probably receiving leakages from the plant of tritium, which has been found in several wells on site. And I presume it will continue to be found. So those are, there's, I could say a lot more, but I've, I've, I've exhausted Thank my time, so. Thank you, Henry. Next. Thank you. Jim? I prepared one page of remarks tonight on the basic subject of public participation. In three minutes, it is quite clear that I'm not going to have time to talk about it. And that is really the fundamental subject of my remarks. I would like one thing from the committee at the moment, and then I'll do my best to summarize. I would like to give this panel a copy of the one-page remarks, and I would like to ask that they be included as an attachment to the minutes of this meeting. So for a change, maybe people can see what the public concerns are. Let me interrupt you for a second, because this has been a, uh, an ongoing challenge and also a source of some disagreement in the past. Um, and Mary, I never think you're a scold, so don't feel like you've ever been a scold. Um, we, I can only speak for myself. I read everything I get. Um, I might not read it that day, but I get to it. We, I will personally make the motion, and hopefully it'll be second, to put your one pager or whatever it is. It's literally one page. Into the, into the minutes uh, for this one, and note that we did not have ample time to, to hear the whole thing. Uh, I would like to make that motion right now. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Passed unanimously. Okay. Summarize. Summary basically is you're writing the second year annual report. If you read the first year annual report, the one thing that is basically missing in its entirety is public input. Despite the fact that the statute requires this panel to accept public reports, to encourage public participation, <coughs> there is essentially no mention of public input in the current report. In the past, the past report says that, oh, all of our meetings have minutes that are posted. Of the 10 meetings this year, only five minutes are posted. Of the three working group me meetings this year, no minutes are posted. None of the materials that the public has provided have been available or made available on a website. All we see on the website is presentations from Holtec and Energy. The public has not been given the opportunity to make presentations. If this panel is even going to make steps to serve as a real <coughs> conduit for public information and to encourage community involvement, it's readily apparent that much more has to be done, and I'll grant that the structure of this panel is set up by the legislature hardly makes that easy. The materials that the public provides should be posted on the website. I see no reason they should not be. They are public documents. The public comments in the minutes should be readily available as part of the report. Nobody's going to go back and read them out of all the minutes unless you put them into the report. Going forward, 
the statute requires that the public be given a real opportunity to comment on decommissioning plans and reports and that this panel consider public comments. You can't encourage community involvement unless you give the public confidence that what they give you and what they say to you will be read, heard, and given the attention it deserves. Your job you're doing here is extremely important. I hope you've had the opportunity to see the HBO series on Chernobyl, if you have any doubts of that. Unfortunately, Chernobyl make, series makes two things clear. But they actually make two facts clear. First, the old Soviet Union did not have a monopoly on an industry and a government that was anything but transparent, honest, or straightforward about nuclear power and its issues. The second fact I think you should need to keep in mind is that the casks, the assemblies that will be at Pilgrim for the next who knows how many years have more than 25 times as much cesium-137 in them as was released at Chernobyl. This panel has a very big job to do. These meetings can drag on. The stuff you have to read is hardly exciting, but you've got to do it. Thank you, Jim. Mary? Send me a copy, Jim, and I'll make sure it goes in. Oh. Copies for the entire panel. Excellent. Uh, Mary Lampert. Give me the electronic one, Jim. Uh, Pilgrim Watch and Town of Duxbury Nuclear Advisory Committee. Uh, I also will send a, uh, an email form and hoped it would get into the minutes. Uh, over 30 organizations, <coughs> national, statewide, and local, from the Union of Concerned Scientists down through Mass Perg, Clean Water Action, Toxics Action, Sierra Club, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the list goes on and is here. They all signed on and they represent thousands of citizens to nine principles that they insist upon for decommissioning. And Pilgrim Watch in its uh, motions to intervene and intervention, we aren't getting out unless we get them either. Uh, first is that the spent fuel should be stored in casts and be better protected. We're very concerned, like Henrietta, on security. That there has to be, at minimum, berms, preferably buildings, and also the cyber security milestone eight should be continued because, as you pointed out, Rich, the cameras, the telephones, all these things that they can have can be hacked potentially. And so therefore, cyber, uh, cyber security cannot be blown away as is currently the intent. The owner must pay for decommissioning in full, not the Commonwealth that would involve uh, parent guarantees, surety bonds, et cetera. Require a study a thorough study of the site at the beginning of the decommissioning process as alluded to by Pine. The land must be restored and suitable for unrestricted use. That would uh, remove, obviously, to meet the standards for chemicals, et cetera, that we have in the state. And rubblization is to be prohibited. Remove uh, radioactive material to the less than 10, less than four, and as importantly, that the dose uh, assessment be the resident farmer and the base basement inventory. We've only got a few more. Keep emergency planning funded by owner until the spent fuel pool is empty. That was at uh, the hearing, by the way, in public health on Tuesday. But you can uh, certainly uh, speak to that, <laughs> I would hope, as being the director of MEMA and likely to lose over a million dollars. Retain the skilled workforce for decommissioning. Reinstate de NRC inspections and oversight 
during decommissioning. So those are the key. Thank you, Mary. And I think it could be in your report. And one more point that Holtec will get the decommissioning trust fund in full. That's their source of money, 25 to 35 percent in profit, that could likely 300 million from the federal government. They can recoup and keep up to 500 million dollars. I just want to. That's um, the money. Thank you, Mary. I just want to point out something and thank some of my colleagues. Um, that is honestly a recitation also of what Dr. Garb sent out this past week. So we've, this list is well known. Mm -hmm. And um, five, five of my colleagues here sent it to me after they read it to make sure I had also received it. If you don't believe that we're getting it, the question is, how many times do we need to put it in front of us to talk to the same group of people we understand? <laughs> there are many of these issues you're absolutely right on. I agree with you entirely. It is the stuff of the MOU. This panel. Did you read it? We're advisory. We've told them this. So thank you. Keep telling us. But understand, we get it, we read it, we share it one on one because we don't want to violate any open meeting laws. But when I get it five times on a Saturday afternoon, I say, this must be important. And I get it. Thank you. Well, they, uh, I'm sure Dan could tell you, you sp you're supposed to, your name's out there, what, seven times? <laughs> to get elected. Absolutely. So two more times you're going to hear this. We're going to go to the back rows. Let's start right to left. I can't see because of the lights are on name you by name. Well, I know that that is not Diane. <laughs> yeah, I can't see because of the lights. Right. I can see you. John Gawley, Hingham. Um, can you tell me what the temperature of the rods are when they come out of the reactor that you put into the pool? Approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 100? That's what I said. Wow, because I heard online they were 5,000 degrees. I don't know where you heard that from. Well, it was online. So, I mean, I'm just a little farmer here. Because um, my concern is still the cast. Because what I've heard is that, again, the parent steel around the weld is compromised and more prone to corrosion. And if you put more heat in there, then that's more prone to corrosion as well. And then you're adding more of the salt there again, that's more corrosion as well. And I want to know, how are you going to test for cracking? And again, I'm still pumping this because I haven't heard any talk with the panel on the cast. We're talking about money and everything else, but now we're storing it in the cast and there's no safety measures in line and there's been no discussion on that. I'm just going to sit and nod, right? I really like that you're the chair. I think you're a great chair, by the way. Um, will you take my propaganda? If you're going to listen to his. Well, see, this is the slippery slope. I'd love to see what it is, and we'll bring it up at the next meeting. Send, but please, send it to me electronically. I am a dinosaur. I'm a farmer. I'm a goat herder. I'm a beekeeper. I can do all that, but I don't do tech. So. Uh, yeah, I'd love to take it. And take, I'll take a look and see. Thank you. Do. You're a good guy. I only got 13 of them. You guys can't have any. Because <laughs> if we're not getting the report on what's happening historically, you can't have my stuff. Um, I think that's it. I, again, I, I really, I think this is so hot. You know, you, 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 what's your line? You can't care about people. Are you caring about people 500 years ago uh, from now with the storage? What's your line you came up with? People's come first. I'm just curious how... How long do they come first? Indefinitely. Indefinitely? Okay, because this stuff's deadly toxic for 240,000 years, right? And, and the casts are starting to corrode after 17 years. So that's a concern of mine. All right? So Thank it's yeah, all give, concerns give, that give I like addressed materials. when we pass yeah. them around. Yeah, sure. I only have 13. That's all right. <laughs> Diane, thank you. Now that, I, you. Now that you get up, I can see you. Hi, Diane Turco with Cape Downwind. Just, I'm just going to follow on a quick concern regarding the casks. And we all know that the 47 years of radioactive waste in the pool has a lot of it cooled down. And that's what's been moved to the casks that are on site right now. But I asked um, at the NRC, well, it used to be five years that it had to, the rods had to cool in the, in the uh, pool. And they said yes, but Entergy has a new um, cask that's used at Vermont that they can cool, use fuel that's been cooled two years. 
they also said they don't know if Entergy or Holtec are going to buy any of those casks. So I just wanted to ask Entergy, do you have the casks that hold fuel that has to cool for five years? The design in Vermont Yankee, the design changed midway through our loading, and we purchased casks that were capable of handling the fuel that cooled less. And we would not use any licensed casks unless they were designed for the fuel that goes into them. So um, we're using the proper casks. The design changes as the metallurgy gets better. I think it was explained by Holtec in the past, but uh, we're using the most current design of the casks. So you're using the new type of cask? That's correct. Okay. And so then that, that begs the question. They said, um, so then the NRC said they're currently working on the High Storm 100 system, amendment number 14, um, that Holtec um, indicated they needed to decommission Pilgrim. If approved, amendment number 14 would allow storing fuel that has been cooled for at least one year. Could you tell me what amendment 14 is? Uh, I don't have that knowledge. You'd have to check with Holtec. You know, Holtec yeah. In all your transparency, could you tell us what Amendment 14 is? Okay, because it, for some reason they're asking for, and my concern is because the original casts were given an exemption from the ASME standards for concrete overpacks, and that actually reduced the standards. And uh, Holtec's Joy Russell's comment haunts me when she said that. Holtec has um, uh, impeccable safety record, and we look at Santa Ana Frey. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'll Diane. send you an email about this. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Senator. I just make an observation. Uh, we have heard, and I have read independently on my own, mm -hmm. so much about the integrity and the the viability long term of yes. the casks. We have representatives here from every agency in the state: DPH, P Public Health, uh, DEP. You know. I really would ask, since we're not going to be able to see on an ongoing basis what's going on at the IWG, I would actually ask that the IWG do a deep dive on the actual containment vessels that are being used on these casks, and please get back to us with some independent, uninterested, on behalf of the citizens of the Commonwealth, on these casks, the history of them, the viability of them, the economics of them, and the expectation, including the warranty, because we. We had conversations in yeah. here earlier in the year yeah. that these things are warranted for either 20 or 25 years. That seemed to be the debate, whether it's a 20 yeah. or 25 year warranty. Um, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I, you know, catch 22. I read the book a lot of times. That seems absurd to me. So is it too much at least to ask you guys to come back to us? That's correct, Yossarian. So yes, thank you. David, is that a reasonable request? Do we, do we need to make a motion or anything? Or can you just bring it back and ask him? Yeah, I'll it? bring that back. Thank you very much. For to the, hey, thank to, you, Yossarian. To, to the <laughs> chair and to the good senator's point, how, how is it any different than the 60 casts that are presently at Yankee Row or at Vermont Yankee or so down at Connecticut Yankee or Maine Yankee? I mean, all of that data, Paul, is great to understand. I think what we need is a deep dive into it by people who know this stuff because that's not our expertise. I, I, but I don't disagree with you at all. I'm just saying it's... It, it but... but uh, Jeremy and Joe, for, for your benefit, Jeremy and Joe, one of the topics that was brought, and you may have read it in the past minutes, we asked over a year ago, what's the warranty period? And we were told that that was proprietary between Holtec and Entergy. That's why they did it. I got a problem with that. It said the same thing at the time. That doesn't seem like that's that difficult. We were told what the licensing period was, but we, <coughs> so if, you know, would, would, you, would you buy a refrigerator? I mean, really. So just that's the kind of little level of granularity that if you can help us out, it'll work, go a long way. Who else do we have? Yep. Elaine Dickinson, Cape Down Winders, and also the League of Women Voters of Cape Cod Legislative Committee. I just have two quick points. One is, do you have a special permit for this new pad? We have the proper permits issued by the town of Plymouth for the new pad. Okay. And when Dan, Senator Wolf, was talking about the, the fund and money that's, that's left over, it seems I recall from something I've read a number of years ago that when this fund was originally started by um, Edison, that any leftover money was supposed to go back to the ratepayers. Is that something I dreamt up or was that something way back? 
Uh, I'd have to research what type of equipments there were with Boston Edison, but um, uh, it would just be a question I have to follow up. Uh, I'm not aware of any you know returns to ratepayers. No. Um, okay, thank you. Once Entergy took over. If I could, if I, I just remember reading three times very carefully a document um, that cited what the actual transaction was between Boston Edison and Entergy. You may recall a number of months ago we had a, had a rather heated exchange <laughs> about the source of this funding and what will be done. And uh, there were a number of people that sought to clarify that. And it was clearly that decommissioning trust fund was an asset of the Edison company that was transferred to Entergy. Accurate? Correct. So um, I've never seen any document, now it may be there, that, that then delineates or says, well, if there's money left over, it goes back to the rate payers and, you know, whatever. Okay. I've never seen that. But it must I have think been a dream I had. Okay. Thank I, you. It's a nice dream. <laughs> so it's BPU 96. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. My Remember, name is Susan Carpenter. I'm from South Dennis, Mass., and also um, a member of Cape Down Winders. Following up on Senator Wolf's question about the profits, um, I have a concern. I know that the plan eventually is to take all of the waste and transfer it to a permanent resting place. Um, I know Holtec is working on trying to get an interim storage site. I'm wondering if the cost of transporting all the fuel is going to be considered in the budgeting of the decommissioning. And you talk about your PSDF? They're going to make DOE. Uh, the DOE has the obligation and responsibility, and not whole text. Yep. RDC considers. Can you step to the mic, please? Yeah, it would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. This That was the last question, right? So there will be a number of considerations when it comes time to ship the spent nuclear fuel once the Department of Energy meets its obligation to put it into a final risk repository. Some of that transportation will be part of the ongoing process of litigation. Now in our DCE, we do cover those aspects and where that ties and where it cuts off. So again, I would encourage you to go back and look at the decommissioning cost estimate and the PSDAR. Now on the, if I may. The question about the warranties, we did actually address that in the questions that I came back with. Oh, specific to Holtec being the owner of this site will have the ultimate obligation to maintain those casts. They will own the risk, they will own the liability. And in this scenario, that warranty is not applicable. They own it. It's indefinite. Now, as far as commercial considerations for other plants, those are not just a sensitivity on our part as Holtec. It's a sensitivity to our customers and those confidential arrangements as well. So it, it is something you need to I'm gonna go back put into context. I'm going to go back and read it again. Is it, so that's why I missed it because it, is this an, um, truly an unlimited warranty for the liability related to the casket? Yes, Holtec will own this fuel as long as it's on the site. Okay, so again, this gets to the corporate structure. Yeah. My understanding is this is a separate that's, LLC being that's set up. because it is. It's Holtec Pilgrim. Yeah. That, that, there's no guarantee that that entity is going to continue to exist after the decommissioning mm -hmm. is done. If it's rapid decommissioning, it may be rapid, uh, uh, you know, turning off of the corporation. I don't, w it's not a question of not trusting. We just don't know the answers mm -hmm. to some of those questions. You know, and, and so maybe the liability goes back to the parent company at that point. But are you saying that Holtec LLC, Pilgrim LLC, is going to exist indefinitely after decommissioning? What I can say is Holtec is the principal owner in all of this, right? You agree with that? That is how this organization is structured. They are the 100% so shareholder of the LLC. That doesn't they, mean the they LLC. They own the ownership, be, yes. That does not mean the LLC cannot, after a period of time, be dissolved. It just doesn't mean well, that. And I don't understand when the LLC is dissolved, what happens to those liabilities? That's, that's not an amateur question. I mean, that's a real legitimate question. Let me see. I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to explain this. So regardless of what an LLC, the 
financials, everything that the NRC is evaluating is based on the principal owner. Yes, there are corporate structure, which we provided in here. It talks to the roles and responsibility of those organizations. Those entities will, as long as this is owned by Holtec, those entities will remain in place under that organization. They don't get to walk away from the license. The license doesn't just terminate. It has to go through a process to be terminated. Now, yes, this could, if we were going to speculate, any number of things could happen in the future. That is not the intent, nor is it the plan. We're in decommissioning in the long, for the long haul. We have multiple sites. I, I think Something yeah. that impacts here will impact down the road. I, I just think there's a very easy, simple solution to this, which is to have Holtec, the parent corporation, put in writing in the MOU that for the length of time until it moves to an interim or a permanent storage site, they have full liability and warranty for the casks. That solves the problem. I, I think that that's the licensee of the spent fuel. Mm -hmm. Even if the physical plant is decommissioned, they hold the separate license for the spent nuclear fuel. Who's going to Who's going to hold it? Hold Tech Pilgrim. They They they're yeah, but, I mean, at this point, that's. But that's to the senator's point. We, uh, we've belabored this long okay. enough, and uh, that's to the senator's point that it's resolved. Thank you. Sure. you mo motion to adjourn or one point. I have a, a question, Jeremy. Uh, um, on the point of once the DOE uh, makes a decision as to what to do with uh, transferring uh, the spent fuel from the current sites, say here in Pilgrim as well as all the others around the country, uh, <coughs> when does the responsibility uh, and or any liability for moving the spent fuel in, say, these stored dry casks on site, um, like at Pilgrim. Uh, when does that transfer over to the DOE and or its contractors? My understanding has been that once the DOE provides for the ability to move that uh, spent fuel, whether it's to the New Mexico facility or some other facility, once they make that decision and they set up priorities for all the facilities around the country to start transferring all of that, does the responsibility for the safety and liability and so forth and so on of those casks end once those casks move outside the gate of the facility where they are and is assumed by the DOE and its um, contractors? So I, to be, I do not know the answer to that. I genuinely don't know when that actual custodian ownership takes place. I don't know whether it's at the repository or if it happens during transfer. So that is something I'll have to come back and, and speak to you on. That'd be helpful. Thank I you. I will follow up on that one. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Put on the truck. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstain? Thank you. I apologize for running almost a half an hour late. Not your problem. <coughs> well, let's see. We're going to have an hour later. We. <laughs> Who's on fun if you get reelected? That's what Have a good mm, summer. Yeah. I wish we had some. I actually want to see what it is.